number of people that predict the end of Moore's Law doubles every two years. Hi, my name is Mark, and welcome to Four Decades of ASML. In the second episode, we're going to hang around in the 90s. I'm going to talk to Jos Benschop about the choices and early development of EUV lithography. And I'm also going to talk to Christian Wagner, who explains how immersion lithography saved Moore's Law. Our external guest is Ruben van der Brink, and he will talk about the history of the internet. Jos Benchop, uh, welcome to this podcast. Thank you. Um, Benchop, how, how do the most foreigners pronounce your last name? They all pronounce it wrongly. It's yeah? Benchop ben with Schop? a sharp sch, sch. But most of them say, in England they are in the US, they call me Benchop. So they soften it. Benchop, okay. Jos Benchop, so you joined ASML in 1997. January right? 1st, 1997. Okay, and, and what did you do uh, before that time? Well, you know, I was born in the east of the Netherlands, in Twente. And yeah. in those days, you studied locally. So I, I went to the University of Twente yeah. and I studied physics. And as a 23-year-old, freshly graduate master student, I had the uh, distinct privilege and pleasure to be, uh, to be hired by the renowned uh, Philips Research Lab, the NUTLAB. Yeah. So at the age of 23, I joined uh, Philips Research. In Eindhoven. Which is nearby in Eindhoven. Yeah. And even better, uh, I, I, I ended up in the optics group. And the optics group is famous yeah. uh, for, for multiple good reasons. They invented the compact disc. But this happened to be also the group that worked on the lithography. Yes. And uh, so I joined uh, on a Thursday, March 15th, 1984. Uh, so this was two weeks before ASML was founded. Okay. And since I worked in the group where much of the technology came from, people from ASML visited the group and they talked about ASML. So I dare to say I've seen ASML from the beginning. Yeah, but you never was tempted to, to join ASML? Uh, no, in fact, quite the contrary. <laughs> I, was, I was quite happy with Philips, uh, Philips Research. And uh, I did something completely useless which was good enough to get my PhD. And after I got my PhD yeah. in 89, yeah. I, I went to a Philips Research Lab in Sunnyvale. This was my first encounter with real semiconductor okay. f- making. Yeah. And um, now, long story short, the, the most memorable moment in my entire career was, well, I worked with Philips Research Lab in Sunnyvale. Yeah. It was the, the YOS before can be uh, described as... Uh, uh, arrogant and naive, and the yours after was slightly less arrogant and no longer naive, <laughs> yeah. because the president of that uh, Philip's daughter, Signetics, came in, and he had uh, two slides, and slide number one said, you know, uh, semiconductor world is in trouble, Centurion, yeah. and slide number two said, you're all fired. Oh. So, they closed the research lab, Yeah. and uh, so I was, you know, without of a job there. Yeah. And now, now you get a kick out of this. So I, I called uh, my home manager in Eindhoven, uh, Gary Thomas. I said, Gary, you know, they just fired me as an expat. You have to take me back. And he said, well, Jos, with your experience, you know, optics, mechatronics, uh, semiconductors, what about ASML? So this was 1990. I said, Gary, are you joking? You know, I just got fired. My wife is eight months pregnant. And yeah. you want me to send me, you want me, you want me to go to this ASML, which is about to be a go bankrupt like the next day. So I didn't have the guts okay. to join ASML in 1990. Yeah. I only had the guts to join seven years later. I became the head of research. Okay. It was also interesting. I was the first researcher. Oh, you employed were by, research. I was, yeah, the head of myself, you know. Okay. I mean, hmm. ASML until that moment did not have its own research because, as I said, when I joined Philips Research, they were working for ASML. Yeah, okay. ASML was a s- relatively small company. Even when I joined, 300 people yeah. R&D, 299 D and one R, R, because all the research was up until that day and for a few years to come, mostly done by Philips. Okay. So what was your job assignment when you became research? What was your mission? Well, that that attracted me actually very much to this uh, job. There was a unique question or challenge ahead of us, which for the industry. At those days, the industry thought... The industry, by and large, and not just ASML or my boss or myself, that the current technology would soon come to an end. 
So the question was raised, what do we have to do next? Mm -hmm. And there were multiple options. There was no shortage of options. So we had EUV, we had ion beam, we had electron beam, and you had hard X-ray. Okay. So that's a complex question with four possible yes, candidates. Yeah, right? So yeah, how, do yeah. you, how do you attack such a question then? Yeah. It, um, so luckily, uh, Steve Wittekoek, who was the executive scientist of ASML at the time, and Martin, uh, who's been my boss ever since. But Steve and Martin had already uh, set some criteria and came to the conclusion that hard X-ray would not be a contender, which was Quite spectacular, because at the time, hard X-ray had most support within the industry. But they, they already, and they had some logic behind this. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were three left, EUV, ion beam, and E-beam. And so what we did, because we were small and relatively poor, we decided we have to collaborate. Yeah. So we started three programs with external partners to explore those three technologies. Ion Beam, we did with a company in Vienna, IMS, and we had Infineon joining. Uh, e Beam, we did with the famous Bell Labs. Yeah. And we, had, we were so serious that at some point we even had a joint venture formed with applied materials. And EUV, we did within our own, let's say, uh, uh, technology infrastructure. So yeah. Phillips Research, Carl Zeiss, at the time we had Oxford Instruments joining, TNO. So these were the well known partners. Yeah. Uh, where we explored EUV. So the question we ask ourselves are what are the most critical uh, things that, that, what are the most important hurdles to overcome? And then we would track progress according to those hurdles and, and benchmark it with our criteria. Yeah. But luckily, we were, of course, not the only one having this question. And I was not certainly not the only one having the question. So the, this was, the whole industry was having this debate. Yeah. And so we would... Sematech at the time, Sematech International, yeah. organized twice per year a huge event. They invited about 200 people uh, from uh, so the semiconductor makers, the Intel, Samsung, TSMC and the likes, the equipment makers, which at the time were uh, ASML, SVG, Ultratech, Nike and Canon, as well as various academics. And those people would gather in a wonderful place. It was a big mistake. The Broadmoor in Colorado Springs. And we would go in and then it was very interesting. So every technology had a champion and the champion would pitch his or her technology yeah. for a half a day. You know, yeah. this is the great progress we made and we know how to fix everything. Yeah. Then after two days, the, 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 the third day, we would vote. So all the experts yeah. would cast a vote and there were many questions, but one question would be, what if you can choose only one technology... Which one would you pick for? And now it comes, 70 nanometer node. Okay. And fifth, in the unlikely case, if we could not meet 70 nanometer node, what would you pick at 50 nanometer node? And we yeah. all voted EUV, hard X-ray, soft X-ray, yeah. IMB. Yeah. Of course, if you look back on this, so you gather 200 experts. Yeah. People that are intimately working on this question, yeah. like myself. Yeah. And if you look back, we are all completely wrong. <laughs> we were not even... Close to what the real answer was, because we were voting 70 nanometer note. Yeah. We were voting 50 nanometer note. Yeah. Nobody had nobody mentioned immersion. Immersion was not even discussed at the time. Yeah. And by now we all know that EUV finally made it into production at seven nanometer note. Yeah. So, yeah. so so we didn't miss it by one note. We didn't miss it by two notes. Yeah. We missed it by Five or six notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Collectively, yeah. the experts. Mm. So, were, were you back then uh, in favor of one particular technology? Did you always believe in EUV or? No. So here is where we tried to be very careful because with our infrastructure, EUV would be most natural. I mean, it's an optics technology. I'm an, I'm trained in optics myself. I have my PhD in optics. So. Yeah. You favor the things you know, you, and, and uh, we had called size, and so we, we knew how to make EUV happening. At the same time, we always told ourselves, because this fits us, that's, not, that's, not the, that's in fact not important. The important yeah. question is, what is the best technology for our customer? Yeah. So we tried to be uh, paranoid all yeah. the time, and we were paranoid by continuously challenging our own belief yeah. and enabling others to prove us wrong. 
But around 2000, we had to choose yeah. because we could not afford to productize all three technologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after long debates, also with Martin and Steve in particular, uh, we put all our eggs in one basket yeah. called EUV. Yeah, so you did. So so we're talking 2000 when you made the decision, right? Yeah. So yeah. How, how certain were you that it would work or in, to what extent was it a sort of a calculated risk? Is, is that, uh, can you quantify uh, it? It was, um, how, should I, how should I summarize it? Ignorance can be a blessing. Yeah. So uh, we were very wary of the risks, but uh, to get the EUV technology to work proved to be much harder yeah. than I had thought. Yeah. And you could ask yourself, had I known what would be ahead of me, yeah, yeah, <laughs> would yeah. I have? Yeah. Would I have chosen it? I don't know. The, I don't know. The, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. But what I do know that uh, as the years progressed. Because I said we made a decision. Now, let me first say, in 2000, I thought, we thought, ASML thought that by 2006, EV would be in volume production. Turned out to be <laughs> 13 years later, but that's a detail. Yeah. But so it was much harder than we thought. Yeah. We run into many issues. And every time we run into these issues, we ask ourselves, did we make the right decision? Yeah. Forget what we decided in the past. This is where we stand. We have new learning. Yeah. We have new insights. Did we make the right decision? Yeah. And I can truly say that every time we concluded, yes, we made the right decision. Yeah. Yes, we will continue to push forward. Because you technology. always saw a road ahead, an opening? or We always saw solutions to the many problems we encountered. Yeah. Yeah. Not also- knowing... You know, you, you see the mountain you have yeah. to climb and you're on top and then you see that the next mountain yeah. is even higher. Yeah, you don't know what you don't know. And luckily you could not see the whole uh, mountain yeah. ridge we had to climb <laughs> over the years. Does But it also mean that you, <clears throat> when you made the decision, that you figured, okay, we the problems are probably here, this is what we need to overcome, and then did they turn out to be completely different? or? Now, one of the things that happened is that the old technology could be expended, extended much further than anybody thought, which is by itself good news. So I will not spend too much time on immersion technology, but as I mentioned, around the uh, end of the last century, nobody talked about immersion. Yeah. At the end of the day, immersion was a great success. Yeah. Uh, and immersion extended the life of 193 by at least two more notes. Yeah. And on top of this, people figured out how to do double patterning. Yeah, yeah. So, first thing to note is that if you can extend the current technology, it, no, current technology can typically be extended further than anybody expected. This is good news because yeah. otherwise things will come to a grind, may come to a grinding halt. Yeah. Secondly, uh, the, the challenges we faced with EUV were hard. And so, as we no, as we then push the potential insertion of EUV backwards, note after note. It became harder to realize it. Yeah. The features you had to print were smaller. Oh, yeah. The lens you had designed was no longer good enough. So you had to design a new lens. The new yeah. lens meant you had to add lens elements, meaning less transmission. Yeah. In the original calculation, we thought that 40 watts EUV would be sufficient to have a viable product. Yeah. But we were targeting 70 nanometer node. Yes. Eh? Later and then, then as as we delayed and delayed and delayed the insertion of EUV, yeah, we we found out that a 40 watt was not not good enough. It had to be at least 100 watt, and in the end, you know, 200 watt yeah. made it into volume production. Yeah, so there was also it, it's not that we failed all the time, but by the time we met our specs, the industry had moved yeah. on and the bar was raised. Yeah. Okay. Did, did you always know that uh, reaching that power was the biggest problem? Or did you figure that maybe in the optics uh, or the whole vacuum environment? Or what, what of the, let's say, engineering difficulties that, that you had to overcome, did you figure were most difficult? And, and, and was that right in the end, that assumption? Uh, this is, again, the advantage of spending uh, two and a half days with all the experts. You vote on any many things, including what are the big issues. Yes. Uh, it has always been from the beginning. There were a few. To- there were top five was more or less fixed from the beginning. For for some time, optics was considered most difficult, and for good reasons because yeah. you need atomically flat A spheres. You need to coat them with a multi layer. It was it's understandable why it scored high. Yeah. The mask was considered extremely difficult. Then the source, and finally the resist. Yeah. 
Thanks to the hard work and expertise and craftsmanship of Zeiss, very quickly the optics made such a good progress that it it went all the way down in the in the in the on the top list yeah, issue. Yeah. And then for many years the EUV source remained number one. Yeah. And that indeed was the thing that was the hardest nut to crack. Yeah. The EUV source. Yeah. Because the, the first, let's say, tool machine that was shipped, the Alpha Demo tool was 2006 or so. Correct. So that was basically <coughs> 10 years or less than 10 years after your initial uh, assignment, right? Yeah. And about the time when I, I predicted we would go into high volume manufacturing. Yes. But but <laughs> let's let's circle back to the source and, and give some context to this. So yeah. It's like next generation lithography. There was not a shortage of ideas. I would say there were too many ideas. Yeah. And you had to pick the right one. Yeah. <clears throat> and and a crash course in EUV source technology, that roughly speaking, three types of sources. Uh, you can have uh, an accelerator. They are big as a soccer field and they generate a lot of light. But if you just start to insert a new technology into the world, then that's probably too much. Then there were two left. One was like a discharge source, like an arc welding. You yeah. know, if you if you make a discharge, if you if you have a this flame, yeah, you can also generate EUV. Yeah, it is a relative simple thing. Yeah, but the power is limited at the end yeah. of the day. And the last one is you shoot with a very high power laser at some droplet. Yeah. Now we started off by exploring many people in the world this discharge source and in fact the first alpha demo tool shipped had a discharge source yeah. it could produce a few watt yeah. so we did uh, maybe one wave of power okay and then we we had plans to go to 40 watt but by the time we had 10 watts the bar was already raised to 100 watt yeah so after a few years we switched we switched from okay forget about these discharge sources let's go laser produced plasma sources yeah but also there you have many options. Yeah. Do I shoot at water, yeah. at, 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 at xenon, at tin? And again, worldwide, many explorations yeah. before we settled on tin. Yeah. Because you think a tin is horrible, you know, yeah. how do you how do you how do you avoid contamination? Yeah. yeah. But so it took roughly a decade for many top scientists, academics, research institutes, and companies like ASML yeah. to figure out what a winning combination was. Yeah. And a company like Symer, yeah. in fact, uh, produced the technology. They picked the right technology. And they shot with a big laser at a tin droplet. Yeah, yeah. And then they were left with the engineering challenges. Yeah. That also took quite a few years to, to yeah. resolve. The people at Symer finally cracked it, finally found a way to really produce. The, they, they had a <coughs> concept change, brilliant, and finally cracked the, uh, the problem. But it took like five, six years. Yeah. To have this breakthrough, and uh, once we we broke the hundred watt, yeah. we actually uh, then then they pushed on to two hundred and three hundred watt yeah. and beyond today. So so when did you know you made the right choice, or ASML made the right choice? Well, there were a few moments uh, I will always remember on EUV. Uh, one was when I uh, was let's say ninety percent confident. Is when we so in two thousand six we shipped two tools, but we shipped them to research centers. And they were instrumental because their others could come and play with the technology and see the potential of the EUV technology. One to IMEC in Belgium and one to uh, Albany in, uh, in New York State. Yeah. But in 2010, around Christmas, we had our first EUV machine installed at Samsung. And I still remember that mm-hmm. moment vividly. And uh, it, was, it was an emotional moment for me because I had worked on EUV since 97. And I had said it would be in volume production in 2006. Well, we'll not mention that again in the rest of the conversation. Here we are, 2010, just before Christmas. You go into Samsung. You know, you 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 have to gown up. You have. I had to do a small test to be allowed in the fab. You know, a short course, and then you gown up and you walk into this fab, and there it was. <laughs> this was or 3100 NXE. So this was the first time I saw an EV machine being installed. Generating light at a customer. Yeah, and this was a fantastic yeah. moment. And customer was happy, or um, <laughs> it was. It was. I met uh, <laughs> years later. In fact, uh, about a year and a half ago, I met uh, the lead guy at Samsung. that was in charge of the program at the time, and I, I, I recall this this moment and how I how I see it as a high point in my career. And he he shared with me, Uncle Cho. He said, "I also remember that moment very well, yours." <laughs> Because the, it worked 
all of you left. Then it broke down yeah. in early January and it was broken for another three months. So, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. We had our ups and downs afterward. But this was a moment I felt 90% confident yeah. be having it seen. When we when we passed the 100 watt mark, and I can't exactly recall one that was, to be honest, must have been 20, between 2014, 15, I guess. I don't know exactly. Yeah. But when we finally met our promise, Yeah. And we were on a steep learning curve and a steep slope of getting more power. Yeah. There was the moment I said to myself, this is it. This yes. is unstoppable. Yes. And and and, and no, the rest is history. Many times we get the questions, how long <clears throat> will Moore's law continue? Right? Uh, because it's the infamous law, 1965, yeah. doubling of transistors each, let's yeah. say, two years. And many people predict it, it will end. Uh, how do you see that? Yeah, I, I, again, I can't resist, and I, I, I quoted it more often, but I don't even know who came right up with it, but the, the quote I like a lot is, the number of people that predict the end of Moore's Law doubles every two years. Yeah. So, uh, it's also interesting to know that uh, many people, it's almost it's human psychology, I think, many people believe in seven years the world will come to an end, including yeah. Moore's Law. I strongly believe that it will continue for the foreseeable future. That is at least 10 and probably 20 or more. But it may change in it may change in nature and it may change how you do it. What do I mean with it? First, let, let's go back in history. When Gordon Moore wrote his, or came up with his famous observation, that's basically what it is. Yeah. <clears throat> 65, he said doubling of the number of components per device every year. Ten years later, Gordon Moore himself changed it to doubling every two years. Yeah. So the more it's not a physical law which is unchangeable. It's an it's an empirical law of economics. Yeah. Um, Mark Liu, chairman of TSMC, a couple of years ago, again slightly changed the metric from number of components per uh, number of transistors per component to energy efficient performance. Yeah. And note again, the word energy comes in. And uh, Mark Liu showed that it continues to grow semi-logarithmic, so exponential, up until 2040. So another 20 years. And there are multiple drivers behind this. So it's important to realize the, 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 this industry will have an exponential growth, according to the chairman of what is the biggest semiconductor maker, for the next 20 years. That's number one. Good, good news. Yeah. Secondly... We should also, and again, let's go back to history. In 75, Gordon Moore reflected on what makes this happen. And he, he, Gordon Moore uh, had several drivers. He said, there's shrink, there is bigger dice, and there is architecture and circuit cleverness. If we look at what drives the industry today, it's still shrink. This is why we build a high NA EUV yeah. system. And this is why we discuss even hyper NA EUV, it will enable shrink. Yeah. But next to shrink, we also talk about 3D integration, getting more square meters you can make by building a bigger die of stacking them on top of each other, yeah. similar to what Gordon Moore said in yeah. 75. Yeah. And we see a lot of design circuit co-optimization. Yeah. That is what Gordon Moore called architectural cleverness. Yeah. Yeah. So, long story short, the exponential growth will continue according to the chairman of a TSMC for yeah. the next 20 years, multiple drivers has always existed for Moore's Law yeah. and will continue to exist yeah. in the next decades. And um, more philosophically speaking, what, what do you think is the secret of ASML? That's a question you hear many times. Is there a secret? Well, there, there are certain things um, I think we do well. And um, and it's it's been said more often, but uh, we have, we it started off uh, the the collaboration part, the, the very close relation we have with customers, with solution providers to the industry, or peers, with our suppliers, with or with academics. And um, again, back to when I started at ASML, we did this not because we thought we thought it was of course a brilliant strategy but we did it because we were poor we didn't have the money to build our own research yeah. we didn't have the people to do it so we had to collaborate with others and we learned this was already known before i joined but also within research we learned how to collaborate with best in class worldwide yeah while doing certain things yourself yeah and this this collaborative mode with suppliers Uh, end users setting long-term uh, roadmaps 
uh, with academics uh, maintains one of our, the ingredients that made us where we are today. Yeah. So orchestrating the ecosystem, if you will. Working uh, within a broad ecosystem. Uh, and and the, the second thing is we always, most of us, and hopefully all of us moving forward, kept in mind, what do we bring to our customers? Yeah. The customer focus is another very critical element. So yeah. I, I got great pleasure in uh, in uh, in cracking a problem. Once in a while, I make a, a small contribution to it. But but sometimes you you crack a problem and nobody cares because yeah. it brings no value. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you crack a problem and the customer, you know, like, like the, the people that that got the the energy efficiency of the source up from one percent to five yeah. percent, that brought tremendous value. Yeah, yeah. So keep in mind. What is it you bring to your customer? What's yeah. the value for your customer? Yeah. So collaborative approach, uh, focus on your customer. Yeah. And uh, last but not least, uh, always always be open-minded about, am I right? Could I be wrong? And that we do this also through challenging debate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, people are often amazed how we, how we are allowed to be disagreeing with our boss and challenge him openly in front yeah. of his uh, yeah. others. It's not with the intent to show who's smarter. It's yeah. with the intent to f- check whether your assumptions are yeah. the correct assumptions. Okay. And, and what are you most proud of? I'm most proud that we picked the way we picked. We made the right decision. <laughs> you got your initial assessment uh, <laughs> and, right. And uh, yeah, you never know whether the others could. Uh, some of the others may also work. I don't know. But the fact that, um, and I, I, I am very pleased. Now I'm asking, uh, answering a slightly different question. That I was allowed to keep going with my team despite many setbacks, and I think that's also one of the characteristics of this company. You know, you are allowed to make failures. Yeah. You are you you are encouraged. I encourage my people. You know, if you do something wrong, just learn from it and move on. And and, and that is what I always felt through many up and many down terms yeah. working here. I think that's a great end actually to this uh, conversation. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for uh, coming over and sharing your experience and your ideas. And uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Christian Wagner. Welcome uh, to this podcast, 40 Years ASML. Uh, We're in the second episode, Growing Up. And today we want to talk about uh, the prototype of the immersion tool as anecdote, right? Yeah. But before we do that, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where, where do you come from? Where did you work before ASML? Yeah, so I worked uh, at Zeiss before I came to ASML. I started there in 1995. And uh, yeah, basically developing ARF lithography, talking to lots of customers. And then in 2001, I went to ASML to be even closer to customers. Yeah. And uh, as a group lead uh, for projection optics. Yeah. And then, as always at ASML, things change, yes. right? And you <laughs> you ended up as as product manager immersion, right? Yeah, sort so, of. So, so um, the first years, I, I basically spent a lot of time in the field uh, because we had many many issues with with lenses. Yeah. So I, again, was busy with lots of customers. But then, 2001, I think it started that uh, uh, on a 157 nanometer conference, immersion was mentioned to yeah. put the water between the the wafer and the lens. Yeah. And then I think in 2002, uh, um, Jan Mulkens together with the team at ASML and Zeiss started to, to build the first immersion prototype. Okay. So before we go there, we need to explain what immersion is, right? Yeah. And uh, it's, it's it's complicated, but can you can you take a step at explaining to my parents what immersion is? Mm-hmm. Now, in principle, what you, what you can say always, if you try to resolve a feature, then uh, you need a certain wavelengths, and, but also a certain angle spectrum of the light. And the smaller the feature is, the wider is the angle spectrum. Yeah. And what immersion allows actually is to capture more angles um, of light going yeah. into the real optics because the water kind of already picks up the angles and bends it into the li- lens. Yeah. Then we get a smaller resolution. Okay. So by putting water between the lens and the wafer, you can print smaller lines. Yes. Yeah. So basically... Um, without water, we can go up to an NA of 0.9, but with immersion, because the index of refraction of the water is 1.44, yeah. we can go up to the 1.35, which is more than 30% of 
more okay. resolution. Okay, 30% smaller lines. Yeah, 30% smaller lines, yeah. almost 40% by just adding water. Okay, <laughs> but that's not simple, I guess, right? Now, in principle, it's uh, it's um, it's um, I think putting the water in between is is simple. <laughs> yeah, but um, to keep it there and yeah. not having it everywhere, there the complications, of course. Yes. Start. So uh, okay. So we want to talk about uh, the, the the phase between the idea, right? And let's say the the real machine that was shipped to the customers. There's the prototype in between, and you need yeah. to convince everybody, right? So yeah. So when was that, and how did that take place? Now the prototype was built uh, starting 2002, and uh, in October 2003, um, we had the first immersion images using an, a rebuilt or reconstructed 1150i uh, bus system. Yeah. And there was a water system beside the uh, beside the tool, which uh, we called the the kippen hock in Dutch. So uh, <laughs> chicken the, the, pen, the chicken pen. So yeah. uh, because it was just wires and, uh, <laughs> and the fence around it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you could expose wafers, basically staying dry. And you you really saw the because it was an existing lens. We couldn't see the resolution benefit, but we saw a huge improvement in, de- in depth of focus. Oh yeah. Which basically proved the uh, the immersion benefit. Yeah. And I think in October 2003, we had the first data and that uh, that really kicked it off completely, so okay. to say. Because were there people convinced and people not convinced or how how was that? Yeah, it was. Um, so um, the context was that um, the real successor of, uh, of 193 was 157 nanometer, but yeah. that was very difficult. So immersion came kind of a uh, little bit from the side. But there were really people that said it will never work. Yeah. And uh, there were many fears. So the water would change the dynamics between the lens and the wafer stage, making it impossible to have a scanning system, yeah. which in the end never happened. Yeah. But there were all kinds of uh, reasons why people thought it couldn't work. So what we then ha- do- did, once uh, we had the working system, we invited customers over yeah. to actually expose wafers. Yeah. So they came with their own masks. They came with their masks, indeed. Um, some came with equipment, test equipment to to uh, to capture the water, to measure what was inside the water after the exposure. So okay. all kinds of uh, scientific experiments took yeah. place. Yeah. But uh, it was uh, yeah basically all the the big customers we came over for a week or so to uh, to expose wafers yeah. and see how this whole thing would work. Yeah. Because also in the customer base, there were people who really believed in it, yeah. right? I believe TSMC was TSMC very strong. TSMC was very strong. Yeah. Um, uh, IBM was, uh, they were very, very critical. Yeah. And they really said that it's almost impossible. And yeah. they, it was also interesting when they when they, they did the exposures. And then uh, before they even uh, hit the plane, so to say, to fly back, they sent an email, we are like baptized. So <laughs> they were <laughs> believers. Okay. <laughs> So it was it was a very nice experience also yeah. to uh, to see that. Well, it's, so what was then, the, let's say, uh, what we call a decisive moment? Was, was that like, uh, you know, a particular customer, a particular type of features, or when did you start to believe in in hey, this is really working? I think it was. I think it really started with this October two thousand three image that really yeah. went around the world, so to say. Yeah. And um, so. And then uh, I remember Martin flew uh, to to Japan, and uh, yeah. I flew with a colleague. We flew to to the US, and um, so uh, Martin flew to Asia, and uh, we flew to the US, yeah. and then we shared everywhere the data, and then yeah. also invited, of course, the customers yeah. over. But I think the picture itself was, I would say, almost the seeing is believing. Uh, yeah. that was the kickstart. Yeah, yeah. And the rest was you had to f- a few say customers had to be convinced yeah. by really exposing a wafer. But I think the image itself was, uh, yeah, that was what basically broke the ice. Yeah. So the first, let's say, customer tool, how long did it take after the October 2003, let's say, proof of concept before we shipped a, a tool? Yeah, the first tool was actually already shipped in summer 2004. And there we were a bit lucky because... Um, the lenses, from for historic reasons, because of our, our our leveling scheme, have a flat plate as the last lens element. Yeah. And so it was very easy to 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 turn them into water lenses because you just made the plate a bit thinner yeah. and replaced that by water. Yeah. That gave us a real head start, and we could really ship systems yeah. to the field where customers could try themselves and do all the development yeah. that was in the end also needed. Yeah, because you still had to industrialize it, I guess, to a uh Production worthy machine, right? Yes, with all kinds of contamination bubbles. We had a lot of uh, yeah. So so what was actually the most interesting part was that everybody thought it was the dynamics was the biggest issue, but 
what in the end turned out was we had two major issues were overlay and uh, defectivity. Okay. And um, overlay came because the water was evaporating on the wafer. Yeah. So the wafer was cooling down actually, and that le- led to very, very big overlay effects. Yeah. So we had all kinds of uh, things uh, to develop, at the, especially at the wafer edge to prevent that. Yeah. In the end, we even uh, added water cooling or water warming to the wafer yeah. table yeah. To, uh, to prevent that. Yeah. The other thing was in the defects. And uh, when the immersion water was uh, in the immersion hood scanning too fast over the wafer edge, you get bubbles. Yeah. And they were very nice uh, effects, so optically, so you could see wonderful magnifications of the pattern on the wafer from these bubbles. Yeah. But there was a major, major undertaking to, to yeah. reduce that uh, yeah. and to, uh, to normal values. I remember when we had the first um, overlay data with, uh, with the water cooling, so to say the evaporation, we were sitting in Martin's office and uh, Martin said, so guys, this probably was our last fun immersion meeting. So <laughs> we realize now yeah. you really have to work very yeah, hard yeah, yeah. to... Uh, to uh, what was to the most difficult the meeting? <clears throat> was it a customer meeting or an internal meeting or... No, I think it was... Um, I think the most difficult phase was when we, when we um, found out about all the defects. Yeah. Because that was, um, was a whole zoo of defects we found. So we... The, the bubbles, of course, but there were also was uh, um, material out of the resist was leaching into the water, and then it was sedimenting on the wafer. So we had really a whole zoo of defects. Yeah. yeah. And what we figured out also was that our customers were usually the lithography people, and they also didn't know much about defects. So we yeah. really had to develop a catalog of yeah. defect types, yeah. and that took a huge amount of effort. Yeah. So, so as, an industry, as an industry, you have to develop a competency almost, yes. right? Yeah. You have to develop competence. We yeah. have to figure out what the defects are. How do you measure them? Yeah. Uh, where do they come from? How do you prevent them? So it yeah. was, a, was a huge activity. Yeah. And that was, I think, a lot of uh, pressure. Yeah. Because it was, um, yeah, the imaging was obvious. Yeah. And yeah. it was yeah. so beautiful and had such a, yeah, also s- such a benefit that everybody was extremely enthusiastic. Yeah. But the defects actually prevent you from from putting it into production. Yeah, yeah. And did you ever think it is never going to work, even though we have nice images? No, no, I don't think we ever had uh, had had that. Yeah, it was it was a few tense moments, of course. Yeah, but uh, I would say, um, yeah, maybe it was uh, just uh, somewhat naive, but uh, yeah, <laughs> we yeah, had a yeah. strong belief it will yeah. solve it. Yeah. So it was a lot of work uh, yeah. for many people flying around the globe and yeah. uh, and uh, building more and more competence. Yeah. But I think we never had this idea that it would uh, would uh, would yeah. not work. So, uh, and more philosophically, what is then, let's say, the 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 secret of the success? So, what what factors contributed to, you know, making it work? Because with immersion, I guess we made a big step relative to the competition, right? So it was very instrumental. Uh, and and what were the key factors? Yeah. So I think it started with uh, with the customers. So TSMC really. Uh, putting it on the agenda, so to say, for the industry. Um, then I would say, um, yeah, Jan Molkens had the team uh, to uh, to actually say, okay, let's go and build it yeah. and uh, and do the prototype to prove it. Um, so that's, I think, two very important ingredients. Yeah. And then once um, you have the proof data, you have to also to, to realize, okay, this is uh, going to be big. It enables... The higher and A systems like the 1700 and the 1900. Yeah. Then I think then it was also I would say a big effort to 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 staff it to to make a big program. Yeah. To uh, to fund it and to uh, to yeah. really go go all in so to say. Yeah. So it, it was not a halfway thing. So no. uh, from the start. Go so once the image was there, it was really. Uh, yeah, we, we I'd say we almost immediately made the immersion roadmap with uh, the higher and A potential and uh, working yeah. with size on the optics. Yeah. So this, this going all in was, uh, in my view, also very essential to uh, to get there. Ruben van der Brink, CTO of the Amsterdam Internet Exchange, or M6, as you say. Yes, M6. Explain to me, like a five-year-old, what is an internet exchange? All right, so the internet is a network of networks, and that means that at some point these networks need to be uh, uh, connected, right? And that's an actual a physical point. Um, so uh, we are a node. Uh, where the different networks that make up the internet get connected. Okay, so you basically just relay zeros and ones and you connect everything. Packets. Okay, packets. And when were you guys uh, founded? 
We were founded um, uh, informally in 1994. Okay. Yes. And then the, the formal entity, the association, because yeah. we're an association, um, uh, in 1997. Okay. A couple of years later. So 1994, that was around the time where consumers really started exploring the internet, right? Exactly. Yeah, so can you take us a little bit back into the, let's say, the, the, the start of internet and the history and how that evolved to where we as consumers can browse the internet? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the early 90s were exactly the years that the internet reached the larger public, right? And, mm-hmm. and that the the, the, the the first forms of the internet as we know it now, um, and many still remember, uh, uh, were available. Uh, but uh, the infrastructure um, has been around uh, quite a bit longer, uh, having its origin in the US, uh, first defense projects later on, academic projects, uh, the ARPANET, um, and it became um, uh, a discussion for uh, uh, the development of several protocols that, that that would enable this network to grow globally. Right, So several of the most important protocols were, were invented during that time in the 70s, in the 80s, uh, and by the end of the 80s, I think the internet was ready uh, to be okay. uh, shared with the greater public house. And by then also um, the famous uh, HTML. Yeah. Uh, so the World Wide Web as invented by uh, Tim Berners-Lee yeah. was yeah. Uh, was available. So, so before that it was basically a connection between academia or universities, military, th- those kind of research things. institutes. So uh, a famous moment when the internet arrived at the, uh, in the Netherlands and thereby in Europe yeah. uh, was when, um, uh, I think it was in 1984, um, uh, the uh, CWI, Centrum for Wiskunde and Informatica, yeah. got connected uh, to uh, the States, to the ARPANET in the yeah. States. And uh, much later, um, uh, so there was already a rudimentary version of the internet at CERN uh, yeah. in Switzerland. Uh, and the early 90s was the moment when uh, uh, when CERN got connected to the uh, Amsterdam Science Park. Currently, uh, M6 in the Netherlands is distributed over 16 different uh, points of presence oh. or pop. So we, it's uh, there's a lot of possibilities to connect to M6 um, yeah. uh, directly, and, uh, 16 uh, points yeah. in the Netherlands. And then we also operate globally. So yeah. we have uh, in total 17 different internet exchanges. Yeah. But you're an in, you're not an internet provider, right? No. I cannot take no. a subscription at you guys. No. And, no so the you, I, so the ISPs are our natural customers. Customers, I would okay. say. Those are yes. the, the ones operating the networks and, 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 and getting traffic to their eyeballs. Yeah. Uh, and, and internet exchanges, they connect these eyeball networks to content providers yeah. like Google, like Meta, okay. like Amazon, or cloud providers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, you, but do you also have like uh, uh, memory space, server space, or is it really just managing? We do have servers, of course, and yeah. we have a, a management network, and of course, we are just an organization like any other. So we also have our our, our office uh, yeah. uh, applications yeah. and that kind of stuff. So um, no, but it's uh, uh, it's mainly the network, right? So if yeah. you enter into uh, our core data center, then uh, you probably can find a, a cage saying M6, uh, which has uh, several racks uh, next to each other, and okay. we we host um, like big big network routers. Yeah. Okay. Um, which are connected uh, uh, to the networks of the customers that are also in the yeah. data center. And if you guys go down, then internet goes down? Uh, well, we like to think so, but fortunately for the internet, um, that's not directly the case. Yeah. Uh, and it's because like in the years, the internet, the, the importance of the internet uh, uh, connectivity is has, has grown so much over the years. Now it's the, the economical damage is so big if, if the internet would uh, would be unavailable for, for an extended amount of time. Uh, so uh, most companies have taken measures as to 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 make sure that they have a redundant connection to the internet ah, okay. yeah, right yeah. so uh, also networks handling internet traffic um, um big networks usually have uh, connections to one or more internet exchanges yeah. and then yes. how what is what is a typical amount of data traffic that you would manage per second yeah yeah so it's uh, we have a very uh, clear pattern during the, the the working days and the weekend days and 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 usually uh, in the evening around eight or nine o'clock it's the is the peak uh, moment and uh, everybody carefully looks at the development of those peaks because they are a good indicator of how internet traffic grows over time right? yeah and uh, um, recently we hit the 12 terabit per second peak and if you compare that to I don't know 10 years ago do you see like an 
exponential growth or is it gradual growth? It or? has been exponential for for a while. Um, yeah. We we the latest big surge in internet traffic uh, was uh, when uh, when COVID hit. Uh, oh, yeah. So of course everybody had to work from home. Yeah. So uh, there was a thirty five percent increase in uh, in internet traffic that year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, by now you see that growth is still there, yeah. but it's 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 coming back to normal. I would say, yeah. or even slowing down a bit compared to uh, yeah. uh, maybe a couple of years yeah. ago. And if you buy then the hardware to manage the data, right? Is it um, if you if if you need more capacity, more terabits per second, right? Is it a matter of Installing another rack, or do you need to buy different types of processors, right? That that we need. Ah, interesting. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So where is where, where? How how is basically the uh, the evolution of chips? How is that? Helping you is that in terms of well, higher w- speed that you can? I would say that that definitely uh, uh, in the early days of uh, of the internet exchange, that was the hardest technical problem to tackle, uh, and it has been tackled by my predecessors. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, uh, d- d- making sure that the capacity at an internet exchange uh, grows with the demand of the internet yeah, yeah. was was very hard. So people were working together with vendors uh, to see what kind of uh, a router and router capacity could still be there. And Everybody yeah. was looking at the next version of the gigabit Ethernet standard, yeah. right? Going from one gig to uh, to ten and and up uh, to accommodate that that growth, yeah. right? By now, you've seen that that technological uh, development has. You know, it's, it's it's kind of it went so fast uh, um, uh, compared to the actual growth of the internet. So yeah. uh, I would say we're now in a good position uh, where uh, it's for us it's relatively easy to scale up. Yeah. Uh, by adding more uh, line cards to our routers okay. uh, and making sure that we uh, we grow with this capacity. Currently, yeah. you can get uh, 400 gig ports uh, at M6. Okay, and and that's all with electrons still, I guess, right? Or that's still with uh, electrons and vote. Pho- so photons, of course. Yeah, yeah, because I so I have a, a glass fiber at home. The, the actual router is that still an electrical, electronic router, or do you also have optical? It's uh, silicon-based chips. Silicon-based yeah, chips. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's one thing you could call it's special for uh, for the Amsterdam Internet Exchange. Uh, we have a, a photonic cross connect. What we mean is because every uh, customer that is uh, connected to the M6 platform um, is first connected to uh, a so-called photonic cross connect, uh, which can switch between two light paths. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, and it's a very interesting. It's also yeah, it's pretty unique in uh, in uh, in the world. And we did that because we want to create redundancy for the customer. So if we uh, if one of those um, uh, routers that are connected to goes down, then it can very quickly switch yeah. uh, uh, without noticing it for okay. uh, for the for the network. Yeah. And and how do you see that for the future? Then eh? do you foresee an even steeper uh, exponential growth in terms of terabits per second and 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 what would you need for that is do you have to switch to optical uh, chips or not or yeah so the matter of optical chips is is of course a, a bit different or if you look at integrated photonics for instance as an um uh, as a new or emerging technology it's still in its infancy uh, early stages but uh, but a very important and promising one um uh, i think um we're far away still from having an all uh, photonic uh, router yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we still need the silicon and uh, yeah. and the electrons uh, to uh, to do the routing itself. Yeah. But at some point we'll reach, uh, like ASML knows exactly what I'm yeah, talking yeah, yeah, about, yeah. you'll reach the limit of yeah. uh, of physics and yeah. therefore um, uh, having uh, the integrated circuits in the all in the photonic domain yeah. uh, could be could be of interest. Quantum computing is something. People talk. Well, is is it also a domain that could be explored? Or? Yes. Well, quantum technology in general, um, and it, which is usually divided with like quantum computing, uh, um, quantum uh, networking, and they have also quantum sensing. Uh, quantum networking is concerned with uh, certain communication protocols that rely on uh, quantum physics. Um, uh, and 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 one of the the the, the most interesting things is that um, you can. Uh, have a communication between um, uh, A and B yeah. uh, without uh, uh, with being sure that there is no eavesdropper. Yeah, right. and this is a, a quantum protocol. Um, uh, so relying on the laws of physics, yeah. uh, you can provably have communication without someone <laughs> yeah. eavesdropping, and that's of course very interesting. It right? is. It's, it is very very technical. So I'm not sure my my neighbor understands this when you say it, but 
But but how far would we be from maybe a revolution in that sense where we actually see the application oh, I of think photonics I, I, or quantum at, at, at least another seven or ten years. Most people are looking to quantum computing and the evolution there, which is getting more and more qubits uh, yeah. together that uh, that can be entangled. Uh, and and of course everybody is afraid. And this is what your neighbor is talking about: is well, once we will have quantum computing and then the security yeah. uh, protocols will be broken. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And that's that's considered to be a danger. Yeah. Fortunately, uh, quantum technology also helps in uh, creating uh, more secure uh, yeah. solutions on the networking part. Yeah. yeah. So one of the, the 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 big goals, and this is something that we are. Um, uh, contributing to with M6 is the the Quantum Internet Alliance, which is an initiative to uh, uh, to to entangle qubits at a long distance. Oh, okay. And so we want to have a like that 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 would be the birth of the quantum internet. Yeah. yeah. And uh, well, the, 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 there there's a group in uh, in in Einte, in sorry in Delft yeah. <laughs> that is um, uh, working uh, working yeah. on that. But that's still. 10 years ahead or so, you say? Before it would be in production, I believe yeah. it will be 7 to 10 yeah. years, definitely. And a more philosophical question, if you look at the future of, of the internet, do you see, yeah, I don't know, in, in your wildest dreams, well, what would you foresee? It just it gets more and that's it? Or also different applications or... Nothing will stay. Nothing will stay as it is. No, I, so, no. This is the the internet is way too 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 interesting and and important uh, for it to remain uh, the same forever, right? So, but but so it will evolve, and um, um, I think that there's it's important to to um, to keep to keep in mind what the original strength was of the internet. Yeah. Um, but we also uh, don't need to be blind for uh, the consequences that we've also introduced. Like maybe yeah. uh, we first thought it was a democratizing technology, uh, but now we see that democracies might be at risk yeah. as an indirect result yeah. of the same technology. Yeah. So this is um, uh, this is something that we do need to keep in mind. So yeah. uh, legislation in itself is not a bad thing. No. Uh, making sure that you have governments at the European uh, level, for instance, yeah. uh, that, that big companies take uh, yeah. big responsibilities. Well, Ruben, uh, thanks a lot for coming over. It was very insightful and uh, good luck with uh, OM6. Yes, right. thank you. It was, right. uh, it was a very pleasant conversation. Thank okay. you. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe to stay up to date with everything ASML.